All right, so I'm super excited to introduce our next panel. Uh, this is a conversation with the team at iRobot. Uh, and I'd like to welcome up Danielle Dean, Technical Lead of Machine Learning, Mohan Mapudi, Senior Cloud Robotics Software Engineer, and Matthew Salvaris, Lead Principal Machine Learning Scientist at iRobot. Welcome. Great to be here. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, Definitely looking forward to our conversation. Uh, let's just jump right in. Danielle, I thought we would start by having you share a little bit of the history of machine learning and the journey, uh, you know, incorporating yeah. machine learning into what you do and your products there. Yeah, absolutely. So iRobot has actually been a company and have been around for a really long time, over 30 years. Um, most of you have probably heard of the Roomba robot vacuum cleaner. Uh, that's one example product that continues to be a core focus for iRobot today. Uh, but in the last few years, especially, we've started to focus on the experiences that surround our products, giving users more control of where, when, and how you clean the home. Um, so ML actually started as more of a research focus within the company, but over the last couple of years, and especially this year, we've shifted to more production use uh, with the launch of the iRobot Genius app. So we support experiences like automatically detecting items in the home. You, you can imagine you could have a sofa, a dining room table. Um, so we enable experiences where, for instance, you can say, hey, Alexa, clean under the dining room table. Now, obviously, to do this, we need to build really scalable machine learning infrastructure. We need to create robust solutions that generalize to real users' homes all over the world. So while we have many data science teams at iRobot, the ML team in particular, we really generally focus on algorithms that run on these robots in real homes. And we really created a, a ML platform to enable development uh, by the various ML teams to deliver these types of solutions. Awesome. And what's your role on the, on the team? So I'm the technical director for the machine learning team. So I lead the whole team. Um, and then Matt and Mohan are leads on the team. Awesome. Uh, so Matt, tell us a little bit about the composition of the team. I think we are not getting your audio. My apologies. Um, so yes, um, so I lead the machine learning modeling team here at iRobot. Um, and kind of our task is to develop and build and train the machine learning models uh, for the current and kind of future iRobot uh, robots. Um, so the team that I lead is kind of being comp comprised of like scientists and engineers. Um, and even though we're a reasonably big team, uh, we're not really uh, big enough to have like clear boundaries between the various uh, components of kind of the general ML team. And so very often kind of we work together to build the various things. Um, uh, and so therefore we have different kind of proficiencies, things like ops, um, modeling and kind of the deployment side. Uh, and we work together kind of to kind of get the models onto the robots. Um, now, the skill sets that are on my team, because we kind of have to have this crossover, um, is quite is reasonably diverse. So we're not just strictly you know, scientists and modelers. We have a mixture of engineers as well. And each person within the team has like some core strengths and kind of core responsibilities. Like some people might focus more on kind of the Kubeflow side and, and training the models at scale. And others may focus kind of more on the research side, kind of figuring out what architectures, et cetera, to leverage. Great. And Mohan, you're more on that op side. Uh, first, tell us a little bit about how you came into, into that role. So uh, let me just introduce briefly myself. Uh, so I work for uh, the ML group at iRobot. I'm the cloud architect for the group, uh, trying to build the machine learning platform. So yeah, my journey was a little bit interesting. I was a cloud robotics software engineer when I first joined iRobot. Then, I really wanted to do machine learning. That's how I got into like in a machine learning team and we were looking at things. Given my experience with like machine learning and uh, cloud, it felt like it's a good place to like, you know, uh, do ML Ops stuff, uh, which, which has been coming out then. And that's when we started thinking about like, you know, okay, we have these models, we are training them, but how do we train them in a way that they are scalable? How do we build this infrastructure that can be used by several teams within iRobot? Uh, 
in a way that like you know it it's it's compliant uh, with our security and uh, privacy uh, uh, requirements so yeah that's how somehow i got into this team <laughs> And tell us a little bit about the platform. So the platform we built, uh, the root of the platform is Kubeflow Pipelines, which runs on top of Kubernetes. Most of the people uh, in MLOps world know that. Uh, the platform itself has like several components in it. It has data infrastructure. It has uh, training infrastructure, which is primarily Kubeflow Pipelines. The data infrastructure is like more traditional data stuff. Like you have S3, you have data stored there, you have databases where you can query, analyze the data. Uh, and then you have several ways to like access the data itself. And then you have Kubeflow pipelines, which is like more of an open-ended way to like run your pipelines. Uh, there's, you might be running training pipeline there, you might be running a uh, data set building pipeline there, or you might be doing some analysis, uh, or you might want to do some kind of tagging. So you, uh, at this point in time, that is how our, our team is kind of structured. At the same time, we even leverage some of the AWS uh, services by default, like AWS Batch, for example, for some some of our uh, uh, use cases, like around synthetic uh, data generation or things things like that. So, yeah, I mean, roughly, uh, that's a brief overview of like how our platform looks like at this point. Right, uh, Danielle, tell us a little bit about the kind of the primary users of the the platform and some of the models they're building and uh, the ways that they engage with the the operation side of the house yeah so there's a, a few different teams that leverage the mlops help and the ml platform uh, so there's the modeling team that matt leads uh, there's also a reinforcement learning team um, that leverages a lot of the inf infrastructure building models uh, we're primarily focused around uh, image-based use cases so like i mentioned before detecting a couch and a kitchen table and objects within the home that we can create experiences around um, but then also navigation-based behaviors. You know, we're essentially a little self-driving car in a, in a user's home. Uh, so all the algorithms that can make that experience really good for users. Um, so we have those couple of teams. And then we also have a, what we call a machine learning integration team, uh, kind of like on the deployment side. They're focused on um, helping convert models that can run on the embedded hardware. Uh, so all the infrastructure and support like CICD pipelines for creating those packages, um, things of that nature to help actually deploy models uh, and make them real. Awesome. Uh, so uh, one of the areas that I wanted to spend some time chatting with you all about is, you know, you, you are kind of on this journey. You're, um, you've got Kubeflow up and running. I think it'd be interesting to explore some of the things that uh, are easier now that you've got all that done. And we spent a lot of time talking about that at the, at this event, but also, you know, what, what's still hard and, uh, what's, you know, where you see the need to continue to invest, where you think, you know, Kubeflow and some of the tools you use need to continue to improve. Um, you know, what are some of the areas that are, are still difficult? Matt? Let you jump in. <laughs> yep, sure, no problem. Um, so obviously, as we first started off, we started developing a lot of the tooling around this because uh, Kubeflow is really flexible. Um, and obviously, we had access to lots of different services. So one of the kind of initial things that are a bit uh, tough is establishing kind of standard patterns across the teams in order to do this. As Danielle said, like for for kind of our my team, um, it's mainly around images, so computer vision. And so therefore we kind of very much focused on that. Um, and so over time we've managed to build the tooling to make it much smoother and much easier to you know use uh, the infrastructure um, and basically be able to leverage the power that it has. Um, we still have some challenges around uh, more kind of a bespoke use cases um, and more kind of around um, like further improving it in order to be able to kind of um, make some of the more trickier sticking points um, more easy for kind of the users on the rest of the team, um, especially kind of some of the users kind of uh, don't necessarily have a background to be able to use it easily. And so therefore it's about being able to kind of bring them along and make it super easy for them to kind of um, run the machine learning training, et cetera, on these platforms. 
All right, cool. I'm seeing some questions coming in uh, via the chat, and I'd like to encourage our audience to uh, take to the chat with your questions. Uh, one of them has to do with the impact of the the edge or the the devices on the way you operationalize models. Um, who'd like to take that one? Yeah, operationalizing models is a is definitely very tricky in terms of we have very small compute power. <laughs> we do not have the luxury of being able to run this on GPUs on the cloud. We, we're running our algorithm, a lot of our algorithms, at least on the embedded devices. Um, so we leverage the TF Lite ecosystem to do that. Um, and we do have a lot of custom work that we've developed around the TF Lite ecosystem to make it run quickly, to make it run um, integrated in with the rest of our, the stack. Uh, and then obviously we have conversion pipelines that we need to run in the cloud. And we do a lot of work in the cloud to make sure what we do on the robot in this TF Lite ecosystem works well. Um, so it, for instance, how, how do we make sure at scale we can test that the models that will be, will be running on the on those robots work well? Um, so that's the, that's the deployment mechanism that we're going with today. Great. Uh, Mohan, when we spoke previously, you described the initial experience that you and the team had to trying to bring all of the data scientists up to speed on all of the machinery required to, to run uh, and deploy models in a Kubernetes environment, pipelines and containers and all that. What was your ultimate experience there and how did you address that challenge? So initially, it was it was on us to like just go explore the environment and see like if we get if we need if we have everything we need there, all the bells and whistles, and make sure like you know, kind of de demystify some of the things like you know you see that this is this is great and that is great, but you have to actually test and see if that works. Once that is done, we created some sample pipelines and we we had some training sessions. We went through those modules. As we went through those modules, we had to like bring them up to speed on Docker, bring them up to speed on cloud, because just knowing about the pipeline itself or Kubeflow itself is not going to help. You have these other aspects that you have to keep in mind when you build, build some of these things. So we gave them some premier lessons on them. Uh, once we've done that, uh, we thought like people would be ready to like go and jump in and work on it. Few people were, but not everyone uh, were able to do that. So uh, as we started doing that, as we started building some pipelines with at least some people using the system, we found some common patterns, right? There is a lot of boilerplate code uh, that, that can be automated and that might that, that actually draw uh, that actually draw people away because they're just like, oh, there is this batch script to build this Docker image and then now you have to register it somewhere, you have to push it somewhere. So we tried to make sure that we identified those patterns and we made it easy. Like, uh, we wrote some internal tools that kind of abstract away that that hardness, right? Like what we do is like you write a pipeline and you just like add one or two more lines and that will take care of like building these Docker images, pushing them, making sure that they're registered in the right place, then run the pipeline. Uh, and then you also version them. You have some kind of tracking uh, enabled, some kind of metadata track within the pipeline parameters itself. And uh, that that allowed people to like actually say, oh, okay, so this is how I can easily use it. Of course, that made it a little bit opinionated, but at the same time, it still had a lot of flexibility that Kubeflow offered us. So, uh, so it's like you know, you you first teach and you make sure you make sure you work with the first movers, then you try to see uh, the patterns and make it easy, and then now uh, the rest of the team will be like on board and they'll be like, okay, let's use this, let's see how we can use it for, for certain application, and then once they start using it, we'll be in a good place. So that's that's been our journey around, like you know, getting everyone on board. And, and Matthew, so from the perspective of the modeling side of things, how how's it been uh, for you and your team? Yeah, so exactly. Mohan has obviously done a Herculean effort to kind of make things easier for us, and that's always been in collaboration with us, and so that's worked out really well. I would say for for teams that kind of our size, I think it's super important to have overlap. Um, if you try and create like hard boundaries. It becomes very hard because then you're kind of asking, you're putting forward a specification and you're getting something back and giving feedback. And that's quite a long feedback loop. Um, whereas when you build it together, it's much easier. And so therefore, I think um, both from a point of view of um, because they've had input into this, they feel more invested in using it as well, rather than kind of like, oh, it's it's something that someone else has developed. So, you know, I'll use it when I, when I feel comfortable doing so. And so though it's been, 
uh, I think a lot smoother to bring people along that way um, than it has been to kind of say, here's how you do it, go away and do it. And as Mohan says, we have to make various decisions and we have to make opinionated uh, choices, but because we're involved in that choice, we're, we're happy to kind of do that. And I completely agree. Like without uh, the teams working together and talking to each other every single time, if we are, when we are designing something that works for all the teams, if you are not collaborating, it wouldn't work. Like we go build something and then we come back and say, oh, okay, this is not gonna work for us. So that that doesn't help. So working together was like really big uh, in our team for sure. A uh, question in from Jeremy uh, for you, Mohan, are you planning on using TFX uh, in conjunction with uh, Kubeflow pipelines? So TFX is an interesting uh, ecosystem uh, for sure. Uh, we've, I mean, at least during time when we explored it, we felt like TFX is more good for structured data and use cases with structured data rather than image-based uh, use cases. For that reason, we did not really uh, invest much time in TFX. We've been like using Kubeflow as is, building abstractions that that make sense to our team, uh, and then taking it from there. But TFX definitely has some uh, interesting packages like MLMD and other things that we constantly investigate and try to see how we can bring them into our ecosystem as well. Uh, there are a, a bunch of questions about the the edge or hardware nature of, of what you're doing. Um, one is actually not necessarily hardware related, but this is maybe this is about uh, online learning and continuous training and inference on the devices. Is that something that you do or are exploring? So t today, that's not something we do in terms of we don't capture images from production devices and bring them back. And we don't do any online learning um, at the edge. Uh, but what we do do is take advantage of uh, learning in other ways that can feed back in information to us. Uh, so one example is we have to create algorithms that work in every place in the world. Um, so looking at metrics to try to figure out what countries we, we might need to do more data collection in to, to improve our algorithms, making sure that you know, they work in Japan and in Germany and all of, the key, all of the places that we need and want our experiences to work well. Uh, so we do a lot of, of, of analytics to, to seed what we do on the data collection side that feed back into the algorithm deployment. Great. Uh are you doing custom? You, are, are you using custom inference engines, uh, or do you leverage things like uh, Onyx or TensorRT? Maybe we we do. Have, yeah, we do have a custom um, inference engine, but we leverage a lot of the TF Lite ecosystem within within that. On the devices. Uh, just to the, one of the other questions on there is like, how do we evaluate our, our models? We actually have a multi-step evaluation of our models. So we do offline um, completely in the cloud and we parallelize that out to be able to kind of do it over millions of images. Um, but then we do have hardware in the loop as well. And we try and make sure it, it doesn't always perfectly match. There are still some discrepancies between executing on x86 and ARM, um, et cetera. So we do try and minimize those differences. But yeah, we have a multi-step process. And where we can leverage lots of compute, we tend to kind of go for volume. And where the compute is kind of limited, we kind of make it a bit more uh, pointed um, in our evaluation. Great. And is simulation a part of the your pipelines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our algorithms, especially the ones that work in conjunction with the robot behaviors, um, that's something that simulation is very important for us, making sure that we can um, test and generalize for all the different room types, all the different uh, floor plan plans. Um, so simulation is very important for us for offline evaluation. And has that uh, presented any challenges uh, in terms of incorporating that into the pipeline and building automation around that? Yeah, it, it definitely challenging at times. One one hard part is is figuring out how much you can trust the simulation for the ML part of the workflow, uh, because obviously you need those to be like photorealistic simulators. Uh, so so doing that is still very challenging. Um, but the in general, the simulation has been beneficial for testing out robot behaviors and making sure that the end to end system test works well. Got it. Um... 
A question from Paul, what is data collection if you're not collecting images from production? Yeah, so so obviously to develop ML models, image models, you need data. <laughs> we all know that. Um, so we actually have a dedicated data collection team. This has been a journey of the ML team at iRobot in general. Um, we historically relied on like what we'd call like the user test team who we have uh, robots out with user tests. So these are development robots. Um, Colin, our CEO calls these like the green sticker robots. So they're a robot that comes out that says like video recording because we know that these are data collection devices. So essentially we have a data collection fleet um, that is deployed worldwide. This data collection fleet helps us gather images. Um, we have users who obviously opt into that and they're paid users who opt into that data collection flow. Um, so we figure out where do we need to collect from? How do we collect from? Um, how do we make sure we have generalizable solutions? So that data collection part of the workflow is actually really important to the entire ML platform. Right. Uh, Danielle, how do you think about prioritizing the needs of the different teams that are using the platform? Yeah, <laughs> that is definitely a major challenge, figuring out how do we how do we come together and we're developing at iRobot, we develop a lot of new products every year. Um, so how do we how do we prioritize between those physical products? We also have a lot of digital features. Um, so one thing that we do within the ML team is we have a formal uh, resource allocation towards an ML platform. Um, and so that ML platform helps drive and we make decisions within the ML team on how we can provide solutions that will actually impact the most the most end customers within iRobot as possible. Uh, so for instance, the data collection is actually a good example where if we think in with those different priorities in mind, we can then look at let's prioritize the efforts that will actually help multiple end consumers. And so for looking at ones that create the most value across the board for all of the consumers and all of the solutions that we, we want to develop. And I'd say developing those, prioritizing those types of projects um, is also a really great um, team building exercise um, to what Matt, Matt and Mohan were talking about before, like trying to figure out what infrastructure do we need to build can be really tricky. And, and if we have a common shared goal within the ML team to, for instance, you know, create a scalable pipeline for tagging for annotation, you know, that's a workflow that helps all of the teams. Uh, so prioritizing the workflows that help all the teams also helps create more value because people are working collaboratively really to um, to accomplish those goals. Right. And, and then uh, Matt and Mohan, how do you think about kind of the, the spectrum of standardization from opinionated to flexible? This is something that uh, another recurring theme in my conversations here at the event. And there was a question in the, the chat about this as well. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Mahan, do you want to go ahead first? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a very tricky question, right? Uh, I feel like the part where you want to be flexible doesn't really work. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't really work if you, if, you, if you make it like very open, right? At the same time, it doesn't work because you cannot get everything into your system properly. Uh, an example of that would be, you know, there is this common infrastructure we want to build. And then several teams are contributing towards this. Then you have to have some guidelines, and you have to say, you know, if you cannot do this, then we cannot test it properly and cannot deploy it properly. An example for that would be, you know, okay, the roles have to work in certain way so that the access is granted in a certain way, uh, and I, I, I cannot be flexible there. But at the same time, there are some places where you know you can say, okay, this this coverage is like hundred percent, and this is too much for me. So maybe I want to like have have some wiggle room there. So. I feel like there's, there should always be uh, a little bit of flexibility, but standardization is something that we cannot avoid and we need it. Uh, it, it makes uh, the pro development process itself easy and in, in some ways rewarding as well when you see like, you know, everything is done according to the set rules. 
Yeah, and, and exactly to Mohan's point, it, one of the other things it reduces is the, the cognitive load, because obviously if everybody's standardizing on common things and uh, we as kind of scientists are on the team who might pick up a new model and try something, if you standardize the repos and everything around it, then it makes it much easier for other persons within the team or in case on another team to kind of leverage it. And it just makes um, everything quicker. It's not just kind of... Uh, from the point of view of offside to make it easier, but it also helps us in the end as well. Um, and obviously, because we do it in a collaborative fashion, um, everybody feels like their opinions are heard as well. So even though it's opinionated, it's it's kind of their opinion as well. <laughs> you mentioned that you've got standards down all the way down to specific editors that folks are using there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it's, it, again, something we kind of reached of over time. Uh, again, it just makes it easier for uh, to pick up a repo. So at the moment, we kind of use VS Code and we kind of uh, standardize around using uh, development containers. Our reason for using containers is um, in, using the GPUs in different versions of CUDA um, and going across different types of frameworks. Um, can be a bit tricky. So by doing that, we ensure that the, you know it's going to work on lots of people's systems. And even though we use Kubeflow for a lot of stuff, we do have on-prem uh, GPUs as well. And so just being able to kind of just pick something up and run it somewhere um, is kind of super, super important. It, it reduces the kind of delay that might be incurred when someone kind of has to spin up something new. It was a great quote from our executive summit uh, on Friday. Amin Kazruni, who's not Orange Theory, uh, said that, you know, as an industry, we're kind of spoiled for choice. And we're kind of used to being able to, you know, have 100 options for everything we might want to do. And uh, he described a reckoning that was coming as we realized that, you know, over time, there's going to be a way to do things, and we're going to have to get on board with with that way. Uh, I agree with that to some extent, but also, um, you know, what we see a lot of is that different things work for for different companies, and uh, the the choice may not be as universal as an industry, but you know, there may be a choice, you know, for a given company. Um, kind of along those lines, Danielle. How do you you know, keep everyone aligned there and moving forward? You know, with the you've got priorities, um, you've got you know, folks asking for things on the platform. You've got product requirements. You know, what's some of the ways that you think about keeping everyone on, aligned? Yeah, so one one thing we do is kind of like a hub and spoke model with the ops team. So although like Mohan, uh, the cloud architect on the ops team, there's also ops leaning folks within the different teams. So for instance, Matt has somebody on his team who's the Kubeflow expert within the modeling group. Um, and he's the more he's more connected into the ops team. So I think that's one way to ensure collaboration and 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 making making sure we're thinking about things the same way. Um, and then in terms of trying to figure out priorities and how we're delivering stuff, um, that, that definitely, again, comes down to what's the most value to our customers and just being really customer driven and then working backwards from there. And how can we develop things that will have the most impact to those solutions? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, Danielle, Matt, Mohan, thanks so much for joining us. It was great uh, learning and sharing a bit about what you're up to. Uh, I think there are a few un unanswered questions in the chat. Um, if you have a moment to uh, yeah. some of those and we'll get ready for our next session. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir.